Okay, thank you, Julie. Um, uh, first of all, this is my I'm um, a species ecologist with Nat Resources Adelaide and Mount Lofty Ranges. I've um, been working uh, in SA for some time with a variety of threatened species projects, but also uh, working with some of the abundant native species projects um, as well. Uh, I've had the a uh, fortunate opportunity to work with flying foxes since they arrived in South Australia, since we had the first uh, colony arrive. And um, it's great to be able to provide you with this update on, on how they're tracking and uh, what, uh, what's going on with them in South Australia. So just a bit of an update on the, the colony. Um, we, we have uh, had a colony of flying foxes here in the heart of Adelaide since uh, uh, they've arrived in Adelaide in 2010, um, but we've got our uh, a main SA camp right in the heart of Adelaide in Botanic Park. Uh, so you, many of uh, you may have already actually observed the, the camp, which is situated uh, not far from the entrance to Adelaide Zoo, just in the western side of Botanic Park. Um, in recent uh, months, we've actually had uh, a few new discoveries in the southeast of the state. So uh, what we've found is that um, we've got some what appear to be seasonal camps in areas around Narracourt, Millicent and Kingston. Um, and seasonal camps are sites where you might uh, find flying foxes at certain times of the year, but uh, then resources get too low in an area, not, not enough food, and so they, they leave those areas and then come back when food's around. So um, so at the moment, we've really only got one permanent camp that we know of, and that's, that's the one in Adelaide. Uh, so just a bit of information on, so this uh, extra uh, camp around Millicent, there was around 15, uh, 1,500 bats, and, and some of the other, what we're seeing is that the camps in the southeast tend to be fairly small, so at, at present, so we're seeing around uh, 1,500, 1,000 bats in some of those camps. So what are the, the bats that we have here in South Australia? We have uh, the species is uh, the grey-headed flying fox, um, often known as fruit bats, so, uh, same sort of same thing. Um, but yeah, their, their proper name is grey-headed flying fox. Uh, there's seven species of flying fox in Australia. And um, uh, this is... Uh, yeah, this is the, the only one we have in camps in South Australia. We have had the little red flying fox come into South Australia um, on occasion, but it's very rare. Uh, they're highly social species, so they do, it's, it's natural for them to hang out in, in uh, large camps. So that's uh, seeing them in large camp is ex exactly what they do. Um, and the, the camps can be quite large from anything from uh, a few thousand to 50,000 um, and some species get up to much larger camps than that. But for the grey-headed flying foxes uh, around anything from 5, 10, 20, 30,000 is, is uh, pretty typical for, the, for this species. And the camp size generally reflects the available resources in that area where they occur. So the other interesting thing with flying foxes, the grey-headed flying fox, is that there is effectively one population. So uh, even though we have a, a colony here in Adelaide, um, the, there is basically regular interchange between all the camps across the country. So um, bats here in South Australia will at some stage uh, fly off and join up colonies interstate and then uh, maybe work their way all the way around to Sydney. And, and we have seen that with animals that we've put radio trackers on. Um, we've put some tracking devices on, on bats and seen, seen the, the movements uh, of individuals around the, around the range of the species. So they've done lots of movements uh, work on the East Coast and it shows regular interchange between, between all the camps. And that's really important because people think that um, these are just here isolated in Adelaide or isolated in South Australia. It's not the case, there's regular interchange. And so the bats we have tomorrow here, maybe some new ones in the camp just arrived and some of the ones in the next few days may disappear and so on. Um, the species is listed as uh, nationally vulnerable. So that's under the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. So they are a nat uh, nationally listed species. Um, and the population size is around, uh, at the moment it's estimated around that 600,000 mark. Um, 
And so that's a, a large number of flying foxes, but uh, flying fox populations are, are very large. And the concern in the past has been, uh, which has uh, driven the listing for them, uh, is based on uh, concerns over past declines. And so um, even though the numbers seem quite large, uh, they, there has been concern that their numbers have been dropping and that's why they've been listed. Okay, so the distribution of the flying foxes. So if we just look at some of these back in the 90s, the, the, the grey-headed flying foxes uh, is traditionally been an East Coast species. So just getting, normally just getting into Victoria and but predominantly along the uh, New South Wales and Queensland coast. But more recently, it's um, moving into southeast and Australia. So, um, yeah, so what we're seeing is back in the 90s, it was uh, there was the only the odd record of the, uh, an individual sort of in the southeast, individuals moving across the foraging in the southeast. Um, but more recently, we're seeing uh, a lot more records. Obviously, we've got a, uh, a colony here in Adelaide and we're getting more sightings around uh, the, the Adelaide area, um, but also we're getting more of the records in the southeast as well. So um, there's been a fair bit of work trying to um, compile all these records to update maps to show a contemporary distribution of the species, particularly uh, in South Australia where their, their range is changing. So what do they eat? Uh, they, their diet uh, consists of uh, nectar. They're, they're primarily a blossom bat, so they uh, feed on eucalypt blossoms. They do get stuck into some fruits, uh, a range of uh, fruits from palm fruits to uh, some things like uh, exotic species uh, or apples and pears and those sorts of things. Um, and where there's been the, uh, the odd sighting of the meeting leaves or what appears to be the, meat, the meeting leaves that may be getting lerps off leaves or something like that. So um, yeah, but primarily they're, they're a blossom bat, but they do uh, feed on a lot of a wide range of fruits. So in South Australia, we've definitely seen them feeding on uh, eucalypt blossoms. Uh, a lot, um, particularly uh, things like South Australian blue gums, uh, lemon scented gums. Uh, all, the diversity of eucalypts planted in Adelaide provides a fantastic resource for them. So, lemon scented gums and spotted gums are very favoured by the, the flying foxes here in Adelaide, the planted Adelaide trees. Um, but yeah, a lot of the actual gum in the loft ranges and um, uh, are also uh, fed on by the bats. So they do regularly go up into the hills and or just surrounding landscapes and feed. We see them regularly in uh, the figs, ficus species. So the big Morton Bay figs, uh, whenever they've got fruit, they're visited by the bats. They eat um, just the, the figs that people grow for consumption. They, they like those as well, all types of figs. Um, we see them regularly on palm fruits, like the image displayed here, flying foxes feeding in some uh, cotton palms in Norwood, so they were um, a popular food source, um, and also a range of things like lily pillies, the scissigums. Uh, so, oh, sorry, I'll just I'll just go back uh, just to show this. The other image in, on the screen shows uh, how flying foxes drink. So they leave the camp generally at night, and um, they'll dip their belly in the water. Uh, and then fly and land on a tree and, and suck that water off their um, their belly fur. So that's how they drink. And, and in South Australia, when we have really hot weather, they get thirsty during the day. And so they'll make that flight over and, and dip their belly. And it's possible to see them doing that in the day. But generally, it's, it's just done at night. Okay, so where do the flying foxes go? So uh, movements of flying foxes, they're, they're very mobile species. So they can, they can forage up. Uh, easily within that 20 kilometer range, 20 kilometers a night, 50 kilometers a night is, is certainly um, doable, so getting out that far. Um, and so we've been able to, without necessarily, there's been a lot of trapping, uh, tracking work done on the eastern states. So we, we knew that having a camp here in South Australia, in Adelaide, we, we already knew what sorts of uh, behaviours they'd be doing, where that, the distance that they'd be going out foraging. So these sorts of maps sort of gave us an idea of where we could expect to see the bulk of the feeding of the bats. Um, so in that 20k, 50k range is where you'd expect most of the feeding. Um, we have done a bit of tracking work here in South Australia and we've found that they 
they certainly do forage predominantly in that 50k 50k zone but we have actually seen some bats foraging beyond that zone so some individuals getting down south as far as Victor Harbour and Cape Jervis um, and individuals getting uh, up further north than um, that 50k zone out out uh, in the northeast northeastern side of uh, the lofty ranges um, and yeah get, certainly getting up a fair way north almost up to Port Waitford I think we've had one individual fly so um, yeah so it shows that whilst bulk of the mu movements are within that zone you do get some individuals uh, which may be foraging further afield and so that's really important to know that uh, the, co the camp in Adelaide that some of these bats are regularly going to be foraging up way out around Mount Barker and down south beyond Wollonga and things like that. So uh, there is often an assumption that the bats in Adelaide will just be foraging really close, but they, they can forage out widely and, and they'll, they, they're definitely doing that already. So um, it's just, an, yeah, uh, something to be aware of. Okay, in terms of breeding, um, the breeding, uh, young are born around September, October. So at the moment, it's uh, this time of year, it's uh, mating time. So the, the camp can be pretty raucous um, during the mating time. Uh, but yeah, young are born around September, October. Um, and then what happens is that those young are carried around by the females when they go out foraging. And actually, the following months, they get too large to carry around and so then the females uh, leave them in the, at the camp during the night, uh, crash them there with a, all the other young bats and, and then they fly off and feed and then come back and feed the, the youngsters in the following morning. Um, and then it, yeah in a few months uh, the young start flying so around that February March period youngsters start fly, making short flights um, and uh, badge, uh, uh, gradually get their their wing strength up and and start having um, more significant movements across the landscape. In terms of breeding in South Australia, so ever since we've had bats in, uh, so we there we had a first arrival of bats in two thousand and ten, um, and in the two thousand and eleven period we uh, had a small number persisting in South Australia, so around the fifty bats, and they that group. Um, did uh, breed here so that was the first record of breeding in that 2000 uh, 2011 period so we had a, a small group just a handful of youngsters um, but they they've basically bred in South Australia ever since that 2010-2011 um, season um, they uh, what we've noticed is that around um, when we look at the number of bats in the camp, we could sort of uh, roughly say that it seems to be around a third of the colony uh, of breeding females. Um, it's very, that's a very rough estimate, but um, the numbers we, we see in that, that camp seem to reflect that. Um, but uh, getting a good number of youngsters is quite difficult because for a long period of time, they're wrapped up in the, the wings of the females. Um, one of the other things we notice of flying foxes here in South Australia, it's a, a particularly uh, significant issue, is that uh, being in the driest location of any camps in the species range, um, we do find that flying foxes here uh, succumb to heat stress. So uh, when temperatures get up over that 38 degrees, it's, it's generally around the, the 42 degrees is the, the uh, notable cutoff. Um, but we have had some individuals get in trouble around that 38 degrees plus. Um, but certainly when temperatures get up over 42, um, you can expect uh, heat stress to, to start uh, impacting on animals and, and animals are coming to that. So they um, basically fall to the ground and, or um, yeah, just overheat and, and, and die. So we've noticed that uh, in Adelaide, Juveniles are particularly susceptible um, and particularly young which are left on their own um, when they're being crashed they're too big to be carried around by the females and uh, they're not very good at uh, moving to the shade so those animals tend to succumb to the heat um, uh, quite a lot. Um, I guess when you think of those sort of temperatures 
above 42 is something which is a very typical thing in South Australia in the summer. So um, not surprisingly, uh, just about every year that they've been here, they've had some um, issues with heat stress where we tend to have lost individuals. So, yeah, so heat stress deaths in SA, as I've mentioned, we, we have that, those temperatures regularly over the 42 mark. And so not surprisingly, every year we, we seem to have uh, an issue with heat related mortalities. Um, and so the, yeah, the, it's something which as the, the colony has um, grown in size over years, over the time in Adelaide, um, it's becoming an, increase, an increasingly significant issue for uh, the camp here. So just an example of that. So in January uh, last year, we had the hottest temperature re recorded in Adelaide. So that was the 46.6 degrees. Um, at the time we had around 6,000 bats in the Adelaide uh, camp, um, of which around 3,000 of those um, bats died in that, on that one day um, due to the heat. And so what we find is that the a lot of the bats will die that day, but they may remain hanging in the trees um, for some time before they eventually fall. So, um, yeah, the the getting an, a, a full count from a heat stress event can take some time because you're um, picking up bodies over, over a several day period, or even it can be, be several months. Um, what we find in the hot weather is that the bats, uh, they, their camp is, uh, quite a small area, so it's a, uh, a lot of bats um, concentrated in, uh, in just a handful of trees in Botanic Park. Um, but during that hot weather, they do expand out over a much larger area seeking shade. So some will make uh, move over to the, the River Torrens precinct, uh, anywhere from uh, King William Road area, Torrens, um, and then back through Botanic Botanic Gardens and more of Botanic Park uh, in search of shady trees and um, um, shelter from the, uh, the heat. So um, that footprint of the camp does change a lot in those, those heat stress events. Um, one of the things we've been doing is trying to learn from these, trying to figure out how to mitigate uh, the impact. So what happens in heat stress events is a lot of bats come to the ground uh, from heat, ex heat exhaustion. Um, it's, uh, there's a, a fair bit of work done to keep the bats safe, uh, to deal with animal welfare issues of bats uh, uh, getting exposed to the heat and being on the ground. So there's work being done to try and minimise those welfare uh, impacts on the bats. But also the, the flip side of that as well is actually ensuring that bats um, are um, picked up from the landscape to ensure public are safe so there's not bats on the ground and people trying to uh, help them who don't have the skills or the, the haven't been vaccinated and so on so they're not uh, making sure that um, by going out there a, a team of people going out there to to uh, work in these sort of heat stress events um, have have a goal of keeping the public safe and, and uh, maximising the welfare outcomes for the bats. So it's a double, a double whammy. Um, and with these heat stress events, we basically, uh, as the colonies got bigger and they're becoming quite significant events with thousands of bats um, being impacted, uh, we've been trying to um, look at how things, how those uh, emergency response operations are handled and review it and try and improve it. So that image just shows a flying fox there under a sprinkler system. So we have sprinklers going under the colony to try and uh, cool the animals down and it does does play a big uh, role in cooling bats. They, they do come down lower and um, they get to rehydrate and, and um, yeah, helps them, a lot of individuals survive those extreme heat events. And we're sort of, sort of looking at other options to try and minimise those impacts. Um, so yeah, we've got a draft emergency response plan for dealing with those events, but actually until you go through an event like that, um, it, it, uh, you learn a lot through those processes. So we've been able to review our emergency response plans. Uh, we've got, uh, there's a far better awareness around the, the impact. So 
where bats are going, what happens during those those conditions. It's meant that we've been able to uh, all the stakeholders in that the area, uh, the Adelaide City Council or the zoo or um, Botanic Gardens, um, everyone's um, far more aware around uh, these events and how, how to um, improve the outcomes from them. And so, yeah, we're basically finding that we get to improve our, our processes and we're, uh, we, we again had to go through that same process late late last year so just in the week before Christmas and in November we had another two heat stress events which uh, impacted on the colony so that uh, at the time the colony was around the 20,000 mark and so we we lost almost 10,000 bats in that uh, period so just in the a um, couple of months prior to Christmas uh, we had a, those heat stress events again impact uh, and basically the bulk of the, the young in the, the colony were lost during those uh, couple of heat, heat wave events. So what's going on with flying foxes overall? So we've had that initial blip in uh, 2010 where we had around 1,200 flying foxes appear um, uh, in, in May, June. Um, the, the arrival of that group of flying foxes appear to coincide with food shortages across the eastern part of their range. So in, uh, along the east coast they were suffering some food shortages at the time. Um, bats, we had lots of bats move into the southeast of South Australia for the first time in terms of camps or colonies of bats. Um, and some 1200 bats made it up into Adelaide. Um, and then they, they seemed that colonies seemed to disappear. Um, but shortly after the bats returned, a small number returned, and then um, the camp here has grown uh, grown over the years. And so what uh, what we found is that we're sort of expecting the, the, the heat in South Australia may prevent the colony from establishing here in South Australia. But what we found over the years was that despite all the youngsters being lost in a, in a season, it wasn't um, impacting on the growth. So what we're finding is the colony continued to grow uh, with the influx of animals from interstate. So that interchange between South Australia and other uh, eastern states um, has basically meant that the numbers have just uh, uh, changed over time and, and we've seen large numbers shunt into South Australia and we, we can sort of expect that um, uh, large numbers to come and go from South Australia depending on resources that's that's certainly become clear and so even in the uh, more recently we're seeing a colony up the camp up around the, the 20,000 but then as food resources uh, run out then they a large numbers leave south or leave Adelaide um, and this is very typical for standard camps around the country so this big seasonal fluctuations is what tends to happen and those fluctuations tend to follow food resource um, availability so uh, we've only really getting up to that um, that larger colony size now so uh, it's, the colony's grown for, for quite a long time but now that we're at that 20,000 we can expect to see these fluctuations occur based on food food resource availability um, and so at present it looks like our Adelaide can support around the 20 25,000 flying foxes um, and then potentially over this period um, food seemed to be um, in short supply for the species. It's only been a, um, a couple of seasons that we've gone through but the, the numbers are dropping again in Adelaide around this time of year so we're seeing this um, autumn drop off in numbers in South Australia um, and then peaks in uh, spring so if we look at the heat stress event that happened early last year, um, we had the flying foxes already dropping in numbers in South Australia before the heat event um, occurred. So um, the bats were finding it tough even before we had that hot weather and lots of bats were leaving this the Adelaide camp. Um, so when we had the, the impact from that, the losses from that heat stress event took the numbers down a bit further. Um, but they have just uh, responded by um, another influx from from interstate has brought the numbers back up again. So 
we anticipate that that will be a continuing um, characteristic of fluctuating population here in Adelaide. So I guess what it's an important thing to be uh, clear on is that they're not really breeding up in South Australia. The South Australia is a bit of a, a uh, not a great spot for them to be breeding. There are lots of young are impacted every year. And so we're basically seeing that um, there's more of an influx of animals rather than breeding up. Um, what's interesting is that adults are persisting. So even with these, these heat wave events, we are still seeing a lot of animals survive that, um, which is quite incredible because those temperatures are well above the 42 degree mark. So to be getting up to 40, 46.6 and still having adults, large numbers of adults su survive is quite incredible. Um, we are seeing exchange between the colonies interstate uh, and that, so that's, uh, it was anticipated. Uh, we've got some, currently got some satellite trackers on flying foxes here in South Australia and that's again shown that, that um, of the small numbers we have with satellite tra trackers, um, bat, those, many of those bats are moving into the southeast uh, and over into Victoria. So those satellite trackers are, um, have been very useful because they've um, helped us detect those camps, in, uh, many of the camps in the southeast of the state, which we uh, weren't aware of in the past. So they were tucked away in the middle of, middle of pine plantations. And um, yeah, we had, hadn't detected them in those localities. Um, as I mentioned, we're just starting to observe those seasonal, strong seasonal fluctuations with resources, um, resource availability. Um, and so uh, that we expect that to continue. Um, one of the things which is really significant is that if there is a, a significant food shortage interstate, we can expect a, a big shunt or, you know, there's a potential for a, uh, a large number of bats to shunt into South Australia if, if food resources are uh, better than elsewhere in the, their range. And so that may mean that we, we have an extra 10 or 20,000 flying foxes rock up in a short space of time if they're having trouble interstate. So, um, so that's something we just uh, need to be mindful that that may occur. Um, and likewise, is if that resource, if there isn't a resource around, well, then they won't stick around for long because they need to obviously need to feed. Um, interesting what, what's happening across the border. So um, the establishment of more camps in the south, in the southeast of SA is certainly what's being observed in Victoria. So there's a proliferation of new smaller camps across Victoria. Um, and so we were expecting that uh, we would end up with more camps in South Australia and we, we should expect that that to continue still uh, further. So there is a possibility that we may have more camps uh, established in the coming years in different parts of South Australia. So for example, a camp, uh, uh, Victor Ha was a long way from the Adelaide camp. There may be an, an, an advantage of bats to establish a camp in that area to save flying backwards and forwards all the way from the Adelaide to to utilise that resource. So it wouldn't be it wouldn't be surprising to see a colony established in that in that area, for example. Um, it may be a seasonal camp, but but those sorts of things are, are what we what we might expect. Um, but yeah, this the. The establishment of more smaller camps is also happening across other parts uh, of the species range in New South Wales and, and Queensland. So the, that rather than having fewer larger camps, there's a, uh, a trend towards increasing numbers of uh, smaller, smaller camps across their range as well. And many of them are seasonal camps. Um, there's been a fair bit of work to try and um, get a, a increase awareness about flying foxes in South Australia. So we've obviously that they're relatively new species to have in the state. Um, there's uh, a lot of, um, yeah, a, a lot of uh, information that's already been um, developed on the species in the East Coast. Um, and uh, we've been trying to get that information out to community here in South Australia to, to um, share that understanding around the species uh, and all the, the issues that are associated with them. Um, so people are familiar with, uh, more familiar, familiar with them and uh, what it means to have them in South Australia. So that's been a big focus over the, 
the past few years is trying to increase that uh, awareness. Um, so we've got um, Adelaide City Council doing some amazing events to raise community awareness. Um, we've got some information on the Natural Resources Adelaide Mountain Fee Ranges website around the, the species and its arrival in South Australia. Um, and so there's uh, in gradually getting more and more resources for community to, to look in and, and see what's happening with flying foxes here in, in Adelaide. Um, so that those activities will increase. Um, in terms of diseases, so the, most people were aware of a, a couple of key diseases and maybe um, obviously with this, uh, there's been a bit of interest more recently with corona, coronavirus. Um, the lysivirus obviously is a, a rabies-like um, virus which has uh, been found in flying foxes. Uh, it's uh, only found in a very small percentage, I think it's less than 1% of flying foxes carry lysivirus, but um, it's a rabies-like virus and so anyone who's scratched or bitten by a, uh, a flying fox uh, needs to be um, mindful of that and, and the advice is that they should seek uh, medical uh, attention straight away, that's, that's really important. Uh, and anyone working with flying foxes uh, in South Australia um, requires a uh, a rabies um, rabies shot, so that protects against the um, against getting the virus. Um, so our message around this virus is that no one should be touch, no one should be handling the bats, um, touching or handling bats. And the important thing to remember is this this applies to any species of bats, so not just the flying foxes. It's also the micro bats as well. So um, micro bats also can. Uh, have been recorded to carry uh, lysivirus. Again, small numbers, uh, small percentages, but um, to uh, prevent uh, the risk of getting uh, lysivirus, it's important to, to remind people not to touch um, bats of any type and um, leave it to trained professionals. Um, so fortunately, Fauna Rescue uh, have been doing a lot of work going out and um, dealing with community concerns or community issues where bats come into a, a horticultural net or a fruit net or entangled on a fence or those sorts of things and, and they're trained, they know how to handle and work with flying foxes so uh, they're providing a val valuable resource by getting out and, and dealing with those, following up all those um, flying fox issues. Um, Hendra virus is a uh, is a, I guess a, a more recent virus which was um, named after the locality where it emerged in, in Queensland, so Hendra. Um, the, the virus uh, is a, um, doesn't go from bats to people, it's, uh, it's usually through a, uh, gets amplified through a, a secondary host such as horses and so that's, that's been a, um, an issue in uh, the Hendra area in, in southeast Queensland where it's been a problem is that the horses get sick and then that can be transferred to people looking after horses. Um, there's been some work done to create a vaccine for Hendra virus and so many people just getting their horses vaccinated. Um, my understanding is that the latest information suggests that the whilst antibodies are found in uh, grey-headed flying, fo flying foxes, I think the virus is mostly associated with uh, black flying foxes, which we don't have in South Australia. Um, but the critical message is that um, if people have a, a sick horse, um, then we just have to be very careful around those. Um, and most vets are aware of Hendra virus uh, nowadays. And so um, people can take the right precautions. Okay, just some of the other uh, stakeholder groups that, who work with flying foxes here in South Australia. So uh, we have uh, a large number or a reasonable number of bat carers. We have five licensed carers in SA who um, are allowed to keep rescued uh, sick and injured flying foxes. Um, they, the carer network also do regular colony checks during uh, heat wave events to uh, look for bats which have succumbed to heat stress and fallen to the ground and, and survived the fall. Um, and then they rehydrate those bats and either get them out ASAP or get them out within, um, within a few months of being rescued. So, um, so they do a, a significant amount of work. Uh, as I mentioned, they're out um, 
getting bats out of entangled uh, which are found in backyards or youngsters which have fallen off adults and things like that so they're out doing a lot of those rescues um, and they uh, yeah playing a very significant role in keeping the public safe and minimizing the impacts on the, the welfare impacts on flying foxes uh, so I guess the other uh, the issues around the um, flying foxes are uh, well known for impact on uh, horticultural in industries interstate um, and so things like apple pears cherries and things are, are species that flying foxes can potentially forage on um, and so we a, a while ago we had a, a bit of a workshop here in South Australia um, we invited some some industry representatives from the eastern states and a few of uh, agency staff um, and we had a discussion here with um, fruit grower associations just to to work through and and understand fully understand what the issues were and, and how we should um, best tackle them in South Australia or, or what we needed to be um, mindful of and so that was a really good a way to try and be on the front foot with some of that um, understanding the issues and, and what the, the options were. There were certainly, um, as I mentioned, with a, a range of things with uh, education materials and, and so on, there's a lot of information being pulled together on flying foxes on the East Coast. So, so we've been able to, to draw on that expertise and skill uh, and, and just uh, invite people in South Australia and um, learn from what their experiences have been. So just in terms of some of the updates, we have observed, uh, growers have observed some impact in apple pear cherries. Um, uh, I guess one of the things in recent years is growers have had lots of ch competing challenges with lorikeets and hail damage. Um, would have been aware of all those sorts of climatic events which uh, have impacted heavily on growers. Um, and so the, the flying fox is just one of a, a variety of uh, uh, production challenges that that growers have um, and significantly there's been some changes to uh, netting regulations uh, which enable growers to put up netting over orchards without necessarily having to get planning approval if they uh, abide by the, the netting sort of guidelines and so that means that um, yeah there's less processes in place that uh, or, um, that growers have to go through to um, to establish netting to protect orchards and that some and that netting is um, can be quite useful for dealing with multiple issues such as the lorikeets and the hail and the sun and so on so there can be some real uh, a, a real mix of benefits um, but that's not to say it, it, it's a very expensive operation to net orchards uh, we have a range of research happening here in South Australia so one of the things that is significant uh, or a bit unique about the colony here in Adelaide is that it's a, it's a significant gap between Adelaide colony and other colonies around the country. And so what, uh, what makes that interesting is when uh, researchers work with bats, like put trackers on bats or equipment which study the movements and behaviours, um, Adelaide is quite uh, useful in that there's a good chance that the bats will stay here for at least uh, a bit of time. Uh, close proximity to other camps means that there's there's an even higher likelihood that the animals will just move between camps and so you might not you might not have your um, bat coming back to the location where you've got a lot of your research equipment so um, it makes Adelaide a, a great place to study bats. Um, we've got some work ha looking at how um, bats are impacting on uh, oh, you, the, the power network uh, infrastructure so where we can manage trees around power networks to minimize um, impacts. We've got some uh, bat health research uh, with the University of Adelaide and Macquarie University so university um, based over in Sydney. Uh, we also have uh, Western Sydney University who looking at heat stress and movement related uh, uh, flying fox movements in um, South Australia and in the Adelaide colony as well. So the image on the the top right there is just shows some some movements of a, a number of flying foxes that were uh, satellite trackers were put on. So that that just goes to show this is around a um, 
a 15 day period. I think about 15 days is the maximum number of days that the transmitters have stayed on. Um, and that just shows what individuals, so each color represents an individual. Many of the individuals are just flying backwards from the camp to a uh, are regularly returning to and from those sites um, but some animals will make uh, various different movements uh, quite different movements each day or trying to find new resources and so on uh, we've also had a student from the University of Georgia so international student looking at some of the ecology of uh, the bats here in South Australia where they're going what they're feeding on and so on so some of the activities in the room have so, uh, participated in a national flying fox monitoring program. So because of all the movement that happens around the country um, between camps, um, to understand the numbers, we have to look at counting them at a national level. And so, um, so those images on the right-hand side of the screen there show uh, a whole range of camp localities, fl flying fox camp localities. And so those ones are the ones which uh, are targeted every quarter, uh, four times a year, to see what numbers of bats are in the, those camps uh, each quarter to work out a, a, a national count. Um, and so with that national count, um, the aim is to try and figure out how the population is tracking um, across its entire range. Uh, we do a, a bit of monitoring here with a population in South Australia, some additional monitoring. Uh, we try and gather some movement information and records to get update our databases. Um, for a while, we've been compiling community sighting information and mapping that foraging activity and range. Um, but now, now that we've got quite a lot of records coming in, we've, uh, we've got a good handle on, on where they're foraging. Uh, we've got the radio tracking work showing us uh, their movement, so we're less, uh, uh, reliant on uh, community sighting information at the moment uh, and we're doing regular camp evaluation activities looking at how the trees are being impacted how the colonies impacted in heat stress and so on so there's a, a variety of things which are um, focused around uh, the the camp itself and that's the presentation um, thank you everyone for listening and I look forward to questions